welcome to the first ever episode of the Retro Football Review. And I'm Kirk Buckner. I'm the host of this program and pretty much all the other programs on the Bucknerverse. I guess I better be the host because I called it the Bucknerverse. <laughs> but I also run, I got to plug my other stuff, not in Hall of Fame.com, the fictitious athlete. The Hall of Fame, the fictitious Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the United States Athletic Hall of Fame, which will have their first vote shortly, www.notinhalloffame forward slash uh, dot com forward slash USA. And I've got with me your friend and mine, Paul Lawrence. How are you? Good. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. Uh, thank you, first off, for uh, agreeing to be a part of this. I can't think of anyone better for this uh, particular project. Uh, tell everyone, if you can, just before we go any further, and I think just when I, you tell everyone your uh, your Twitter handle, you'll see why I picked you. Yeah, so I go by uh, PFHOF, Pro Football Hall of Fame guy, Canton guy. So yeah, I'm active on Twitter, been for a while, just sort of looking at the Hall of Fame, you know, issues and getting in interesting debates and discussions about candidates and the voting process, of course, you know, right in the middle of it right now, you know, they're, yes. they're you know, working towards in, geez, well, less, about a month or so, they'll be deciding yeah. next class. We won't know that till mm -hmm. right before the Super Bowl, but uh, yeah, it's, it's sort of peak season for us, uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame guys. Oh, absolutely. And it's games like this that can make a Hall of Fame career or can kill one. I don't know that it necessarily killed any uh, on this one, but uh, I think we saw a few people made uh, on this one. Uh, I almost called you back and said, you know what, I want to go with something different because I actually thought that there was footage of the full game. I didn't realize there wasn't. So uh, we're going to be, as we do this, uh, I thought this would be as far back as we would go. I didn't think there would be a lot of point doing Super Bowl one, Super Bowl two. I mean, they weren't even fully attended yet. And I think when we get to the next one, which I, I think we can both agree would be Super Bowl three, that's really when the Super Bowl became the Super Bowl. Yeah. But neither here nor there. Uh, <laughs> so you are a Dallas Cowboys fan, so full disclosure there. I, sure. <laughs> I, as a Saints fan, it'll be many years before we get to talking about any team I really care about <laughs> as, as we do this. But uh, it's almost fitting. We're recording this on December 29th, uh, 2022. And on the last slate of Sunday football games, uh, I, I was watching Red Zone, and they were commenting that it was the coldest day ever combined. But not as cold as this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, December yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's just kind of crazy. Yeah, I mean, we're getting into it a little bit. This was a historical game for a lot of reasons. But today, you know, when it, it always comes up, and we've had a couple of really bitterly cold games this, this season you now. Right. It always comes up. They always want to highlight and compare it, whether it's in Green Bay or Buffalo, mm -hmm. Chicago. It doesn't really matter. You know, those whole windy, windy, windy cities come up and um, yeah. winter games are like that. And, and this is sort of one that's always, always mentioned. Um, but as we go through this, yeah, we're going to point out, yeah, that's kind of the legacy and kind of the tagline the game's been given is the ice ball. But there's a lot more of this game in terms of this historical context that, that's allowed it to continue to linger in people's minds, even though, you know, it, it, the first thing that comes up is it's a cold winter day in the NFL. So let's mention the ice bowl. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And I think it'll probably live on forever, especially considering that Dallas and green Bay, even when they're not good, remain the two, two of the most, I'd say five iconic franchises in, in pro football. Yeah. And I mean, if you think of the, the context going into this game, right, they had played, right not even a year before on January 1st of the same year, they played in the previous mm -hmm. NFL championship game in, in Dallas. In those years, the game, all the, the game site um, alternated between East and West um, conferences. And yeah, they didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah. They didn't start doing that till the seventies some point. And so, yeah, Dallas had hosted uh, green Bay um, in the earlier January 1st. That was of course the, the first, NFL championship game that would lead into the winner playing the, uh, the team from the AFL. Of course, that was also a, a very tightly contested, very high profile game. You don't hear much about it today because the next game was the first Super Bowl, and um, that's kind of where it went. But so less than a year later, here we are, the next season at the end, which had just happened to fall on, on December 31st, the two teams meet again, but this time we're in frigid Green Bay on Lambeau yeah. Field. 
you know, and these were two teams, you know, if you understand your history, of course, you know, the Packers had won multiple NFL championships in the sixties. They were already a dynasty really. Mm -hmm. And it was that first Super Bowl from the previous season. And then this game and the results of this um, would cement that. In fact, this was Vince Lombardi's last NFL championship game. He would go on, of course, to coach him in the Super Bowl. So they were an established dynasty at that time with a lot of famous players, a long legacy in history of that. The Cowboys had only been in existence since 1960. Um, they managed to move up pretty quickly at that time. It was hard in that era to really build a franchise very quickly. It's different now with the way things are done. Um, with free agency and draft picks, et cetera. But so the Cowboys actually moved fairly quickly in the mid sixties to be a playoff contender, um, kind of built that prestige, got in the playoffs and well, we're, we're in an era here of several years where they would end up falling short. And, and this is one of these games, but they were clearly an elite team. This was not a matchup of, you know, two teams that nobody knew about or were surprised. These were two of the premier teams at that time right. in the NFL. I think uh, there's a lot of things that are also very interesting here. Uh, my beloved Saints joined the league, which now forces uh, four divisions. So we have actually now have a playoff yep. to get into this game. So uh, I didn't know about the, the the interesting alignments here. So Dallas wins the uh, the Capital Division. Okay, what a strange name that is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so by going uh, nine and five, uh, also in that division is Philadelphia, Washington, as we know, and then New Orleans. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, Cleveland wins the Century Division, another stupid name. In that division, the Giants, St. Louis, and Pittsburgh. One of those teams makes sense, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> in the West, uh, the Rams are actually the best team. They're winning the Coastal uh, with only uh, one loss. Baltimore had the same record, but they lost a tiebreaker. And apparently they lost the, the last week, which knocked them out. So uh, Green Bay and Dallas aren't even going in here with the, two, the top two records. But in the Rams division, which I, again, find fascinating here. Uh, <laughs> did I not? Yes, I did. No, I did. Oh, yeah, Baltimore. Because you have Baltimore in the West, San Francisco, yeah. and Atlanta. Like, what the hell? Yeah, I mean, when, you know, you, you've got those early NFL teams, right? And then in the 60s, you had this rapid expansion, yeah. um, including the Cowboys and others. And, and it, I think the league was really sort of mixed up, right? And trying to figure out, evening out these things. So it didn't make any real sense. Mm -hmm. and, and some of these, um, there weren't really much in terms of traditional rivalries that we see yeah. today in almost every division. Except for this one. Except for this one, you're right. The, the, yeah, for the, Green Bay in the Central. Is, yeah, so they win and, that. Um, Chicago. It wouldn't really, you know, wouldn't really settle out till after the full merger in the '70s, yeah. the NFL and the realignment, and more more teams being added would settle in. But you're right, you mm -hmm. know, for all these decades, this idea of keeping the Cowboys together with some of their traditional rivals dates back to when they first came in the league. Even though, mm -hmm. you said there were some very odd other placements of franchises just to fill out divisions to kind of even things out. And yeah, as it grew. Yeah of having to add the additional game. You know, we think today of multiple rounds of playoffs back then in terms of the NFL, right? There was just the two rounds and, and here we are already at a championship game when now we're still playing the season. <laughs> we have Green Bay representing the West, even though they're further uh, yeah. East than Dallas, but whatever, whatever. I mean, like it wouldn't be all that long after this. Well, it would be long after this when Tampa Bay joined and Tampa Bay was in the NFC North. Yeah, yeah, it was it was kind of crazy. It never made any sense. It was just sort of a scheduling. I mean, the other thing that really the really other historical part of this game that most people who understand history might be realize is is Vince Lombardi and Tom Landry were assistant coaches in the yes. Giants in the fifties um, in a championship level team, and they both kind of brought their own unique personalities, their own skill sets. Uh, Lombardi was seen more of an offensive player or sorry coach and much more of a motivator, a high energy, whereas, you know, Tom Landry sort of got the, you know, the, the idea of being unemotional, the plastic, mm -hmm. one of his former players used to call him, not, not in a good positive way, but he was a true innovator on the defensive side. He would later, of course, be innovative with a shotgun and other things on the offensive side of the game. But these were two guys who had already built history. Landry, of course, played in the league in the 50s, 40s, 50s. 
Uh, and then they went their separate ways. Um, either one of them could have been the, N- the head coach of the NFL, uh, New York Giants. That didn't happen. They both went into franchises in, in the case of Lombardi to Green Bay, which had had a few decades or so of, you know, not being the premier franchise like they were early in the history of the league. And he basically rebuilt that entire team into what we, the legacy that we have today in Green Bay. Mm. And likewise for, for Landry, I mean, you took over a, um, a brand new franchise after a few years was not doing very well. And there was thought, well, maybe he wasn't the guy. So the owner at the time, Clint Richardson said, no, he's my guy. And he signed him to a 10 year contract. Oh, 10 years. I didn't know that playoff success um, in the mid sixties to say, he's my guy. I'm going to stick with him. You would never see that today, even with somebody taking on a new franchise after a few years of, an owner or GM isn't seeing any progress, you know, they're going to pull the hook and move on. Next guy that, that did not happen. So both of them, you know, sort of had their reputation. And by the time we get to this game, well cemented in terms of the teams they built, the play that they were pushing, the kind of mm-hmm. thinking, the game planning, all of that, the two just sort of came together for the second time in, in less than a year. I also to uh, leading up into this. So both Dallas and Green Bay destroyed their opponents. Uh, Dallas, especially uh, defeats Cleveland 52 to 14. Uh, Green Bay wins 28 to seven. So no point even trying. That's why we're not reviewing those games because yeah. it'll be interesting. I think after Super Bowl three, we might do every Super Bowl. I don't or maybe not. I don't know. So there's a couple blowouts, uh, especially yeah. when I was a kid in the 80s. <laughs> Oof. But uh, I think safe to say when a lot of people woke up this morning they didn't think that there was actually going to be a game and that's on both sides of the ball uh so i was reading an oral history and actually before i sort of like go any further i did kind of I, I watched the game in the best way possible that was that's available on youtube so shout out to a youtube channel that's called godzilla rocks yep. oh so you probably yeah so yeah yeah i saw that yep that's great yeah, yeah, you just don't find this stuff very easily yeah I- and stuff but somebody who's actually managed to stitch a lot of it together mm-hmm. into kind of a, the best he could do in terms of a cohesive sort of game film to take right. is unfortunately the best best thing we really have out there for people to see so that's great yeah so anyone who's uh, after you watch this yeah. with us then if you want to see like the best sort of footage out there uh obviously both paul and i can recommend that it is he used as much of uh, mostly packers radio and he just used every clip that was available to him yeah. And for the most part, he got 90% of the plays, I think is what it said in the comments. And, you know, you're not really missing anything. And just the footage is just, there's so much more staggering differences. I, I think also maybe for myself, maybe more for me than for yourself, Paul, because I think you're, you've deep dived into more football history than I have. Uh, every time I do, it's usually just in terms of, I'm crunching numbers, looking at people who I think should be Hall, but I'm always, I'm, I'm far better admittedly in the more modern game than I am in in this. So this was for me so much, so much fun. But anyway, th- people are waking up and it's minus 15 and you would, uh, I, I'm still in Canada, you're a uh, native Canadian. So uh, so you speak both Celsius and Fahrenheit. Uh, That's right, if I can remember the conversion. <laughs> yeah, so they're waking up and they didn't know that from what I was reading that it was gonna be this cold. They thought it was gonna be that cold the next day. And it, much like it is now, here's one thing that hasn't changed. Weathermen suck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you look a bit of it and it, yeah, it was this weather front that was sort of sort of passed through, but you know, it, it sort of lingered throughout the night and you're absolutely right. I think the players and the coaches, I mean, at this stage in the sixties, I mean, they don't have all the advanced weather, but they weren't, they, so they, you know, they, they expect it to be cold. It's green Bay. It's you know, December. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I think on both sides, certainly, Nobody went to bed the night before thinking, oh, my God, how are we going to manage the game? It's going to be so brutally cold. They were prepared for what they thought they were going to deal with. But when they woke up and there's all kinds of anecdotes and stories, there's been a lot written. There's a lot of oral histories from players. Mm -hmm. You really want to dive into that. People can find a lot of this stuff out there. But there's stories about, you know, one player getting in the morning and, and throwing a glass of water against the inside of his window in the hotel and seeing it froze solid. Right. And Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, you know, and, and other stories about when players actually got to the, to the site and to the field and mm. yeah, I don't, and, and you're right. I mean, up until this time, the league just played games and that's just the way it was. And there had been cold games before, but this was 
I think because it was a playoff game and, and a national television at the time when TV was yeah. really emerging, although the technology was still kind of primitive by today's standards, it was being hyped as, as we do today, right? That kind of but, but it's also game and, and the fans are showing up and then yeah. what do we got? It's but, and but, <laughs> but it's also an era where it's like a pl- pl- uh, player second, NFL first. Oh yeah, I, I don't know that we've gotten that. But I mean, uh, one, one thing I also learned too uh, that I didn't know, Pete Rozelle was uh, the commissioner, was not there. He was at the AFL championship. So if Pete Rozelle is there experiencing the cold, does this game happen? And some of the players said, probably not. And I have to imagine it's a bit of a, it's messing with your mind when I'm sure almost all the players, not all of them, but a lot of them probably thought this is not happening Yeah. until you're out there and it's happening. So again, just putting it more in that perspective, uh, when they were there the day before, apparently it was, uh, what was it, 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so I have to think in my head what that, what that is because, again, Canadian. Ours makes sense, sorry. But no, I'll, I'll, I'll die on the hill on that one. <laughs> Having said that, don't ask me how many meters tall I am. I can't answer that. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> a trickier one to do. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it, it may, I, I don't think it was, they were not all the norm, right? I mean, it's late December. In Green Bay, there's mm-hmm. certainly been games played throughout the NFL history late in the season, early playoffs in cold weather. So yeah, I don't, I don't think anyone the day before really thought much more of that. Um, the teams would have been prepared. The Cowboys would have traveled with typical cold wind weather uh, attire. I mean, but well, they would soon find out that there was far there was no such attire that existed necessary. So, like nothing existed back then. That that yeah. Could, could have even prepared them for it, even if they knew it was going to be that way. Maybe it's almost best. Uh, you, you know, so you're going through all that emotion, but then you're, you're not sitting there thinking about it for, for a couple of days leading up to it. Uh, one thing I also did not know, uh, one of Lombardi's innovation uh, was, I guess, the electric grid that he had yes. put, up, put <laughs> under there. And while this is a great idea, it is a great idea, keeping the, keeping the, the, the grass warm, uh, what it failed to do is when they covered it, it just, because it kept everything warm, it made everything moist. So then it froze almost on impact. So Lombardi, the biggest genius maybe that ever existed in football, wasn't too smart on this one. <laughs> so, but Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's sort of... <laughs> kind of like that. <laughs> wrong time, wrong place to try yeah. out. I, I don't know how long it had actually been in place in, in the field, but it was sort of innovative for its time. And, and yeah, there, and there was some initial logic behind it, but the practicality, because the practice at that time, right, was just to cover the field with a tarp. And I understand you put mm-hmm. on it to keep it insulated. You're right. And then you peel everything back. And I mean, the ground's still cold, but it's not hopefully rock solid frozen and you can still get your footing on it. But you're right, it had this, it basically froze all over. You know, and for years you would hear stories from some of the Cowboys in particular that, well, did it not work or did he simply turn it off, you know, and not let the heating coils warm? I mean, there's this sort of odd conspiracy. And I guess for years it was given the nickname Lombardi's Folly, you know, the technology didn't work. Um, And it's just one of these unique kind of, you know, anecdotes about about this whole story and and, and that you just can't prepare for what they were going to experience. So on um, the footage that I guess we both watched, it starts off with, a well, CBS, they, they ha- had the broadcast, but we didn't actually listen to CBS uh, call that. And it's pretty much just three comp- three people, uh, Ray Scott, Jack Buck, and uh, Frank Gifford. Mm-hmm. Uh, somewhere, uh, Kathy Lee was uh, pretty excited, <laughs> or maybe not. Uh, <laughs> or I wonder if Frank knew that that his uh, future wife was was uh, still in still in school. I don't know. Um, yeah but, yeah um, could be i don't know <laughs> i'm not here to rip on frank uh but his hair looked fantastic i'll say that and they're all talking about how cold it is uh, except but frank doesn't look cold I'll, I'll, like man he looks what a pro that that guy was uh but but they're showing like everything how it's like minus 15 fahrenheit uh that, that was lots of footage there uh green bay kicks off and they, they uh, what I was watching was pretty much mostly the Packers broadcast or radio broadcast, and 
he's joking that, you know, uh, well, we're, we've got a game if the ball doesn't explode on impact. And uh, really the ball is the, is the biggest star of this whole game because mm-hmm. we're watching, yeah, yeah, it was a different time. And yes, kickers and punters weren't nearly as good as they are now, but their balls are going nowhere uh, off their feet off their foot people are uh or people are dropping balls maybe they wouldn't normally uh meredith is awful yeah in this yeah. whole game uh and i'm sure that had a lot to do with that uh dandy don never liked that nickname but i don't know that's that's neither sure nor there uh so dandy don so uh so what it was, so it's returned uh da, 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 so kickoff by green bay uh and, I, and the, actually, I was actually learning here too that with Green Bay only the last couple of years. Uh, that's uh, Chandler, who was the, who was uh, is his final year uh, as a kicker or in, in the NFL. And Green Bay had only the last couple of years. Just putting it putting it again in the historical perspective, Green Bay had only now begun having a, a dedicated kicker and a dedicated punter. Right. Uh, Green Bay would use the same uh, kicker, and I'll get to him a bit later. Uh, it's returned by by uh, Slim Stokes. Uh, we turned that uh, we turned to the 28 uh, or Sim Stokes, sorry, not Slim. Uh, returned to the 28 yard line, and that was his last return that he would ever do, and the only time we're ever going to mention that name. He was never seen again. <laughs> He's got his little piece of history. Yeah, well, absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> more than I can say. Uh, so Don throws to Bob Hayes, who gets to uh, the 43, and tackled by Willie Wood. Willie Wood's probably the name that I heard the most. Yeah. in this entire game uh one thing also too i learned uh hayes this was probably this was his highlight really of the game hayes eventual hall of famer they figured out because it was so cold that whenever he put his hands in his pocket he wasn't yep. in yeah so it's, it's like why why aren't we hearing more about hayes because they knew every time when it was targeted for him like yep. so like like fascinating there and then another thing i forgot completely I always forget that Dan Reeves was a Dallas Cowboy. I always forget because he, he gets the, the rush on the, on the next one. Uh, people, I think, of our generation, we think of him first. Well, maybe not you as a Dallas fan, but uh, as the longtime Broncos head coach and just a, lo- a longtime head coach uh, for, for, for many, many years. Uh, this was his last, he had two really good years. This was the last of the two. Uh, but so he rushes up for four and Meredith on the next, pa- next pass, is incomplete and then another handoff to Reeves, but that goes nowhere. We're gonna see a lot of that. Uh, one thing is I'm just watching the plays that I could see. How many of these that, that we would watch would say, oh, we, we were thinking, okay, that's a penalty. So we're looking at it with 2022 yeah. eyes. Yeah. And like, that's all over the place. And there are some things that are just so egregious now. Yeah. But, you know, at the same time, you gotta, you, you got to protect the stars and you're protecting the athletes. Yeah. And, you know, it was a different era, right. And we wouldn't see a lot of the the changes that would begin to favor the offense later. I mean, the defense really would often dominate. I mean, it's interesting, you know, the AFL sort of opened up the game a little more in terms of a passing Mm -hmm. game, but we're, you know, we're in an era here in the sixties, there were some good quarterbacks and there were some good passers, but we are talking at least for the NFL at this era it is a run-dominated offense for the most part. Right. I'm not throwing the deep bomb because, for a variety of reasons. And one is because receivers can be mauled all the way down the field, you know, push shoved. I mean, it's, it's it was a lot different and more of a conservative game and more of a, what we kind of, you know, head against head pounding, push your will over the other team, dominate on both sides of the ball. So very this game very much, I mean, the weather certainly made it even more, of that run focus defense dominated game because you mentioned just handling the ball was, was such a challenge, but it, it was also reflective of the time at the, you know, the game at the time, at least in the NFL. And you see that, I mean, they're more of a cautious conservative play calling, but yeah. And, and you know, 30 million people apparently watch this game. So it's high profile. And just like today, you know, the, the, I, the officials might've decided let, let them play. And unless it's really egregious or something, you know, we're just going to let the ticky tack. What we today was, you know, often get called, you know, the shoving, the pushing, the holding, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and some of the brutal kind of violent part of the game. 
that just was the nature of the game to let these guys just play it out. And we have to remember the players are suffering. The fans are brutal. The wind chill is terrible. And right. so what you and the TV, I mean, everybody's suffering and I don't think anybody, they just, they just want to play the game and, and I, you know, maybe to some extent just get the damn you know thing over with. Yeah. Cause it was getting brutal. There's a story, you know, about one of the officials blowing the whistle and pulling the whistle away from his mouth and ripping his lips off and blood came pouring out. Well, it I mean, didn't pour out. It just froze there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's, yeah, it was so yeah. cool. You know, and the rest of the game, the guys got, you know, it's just, it's yeah. crazy, but we're still playing football and, and that was the era. Yeah. And, and Paul, I'm glad you mentioned wind chill because we say it's minus 15. That's the official temperature, but that's not the official temperature. And uh, you as a, a natural born Canadian know that, and, and I'm sure all, all the people in the Northern United States and especially uh, our friends out in Buffalo and, and uh, everything around Lake Erie right around as, as we're, we're discussing this. You know, I, I forget what comedian said this, but I mean, like, it's minus 10, but it's uh, actually minus 21 with the wind chill. Well, let's say it, it's minus 21 because it's like it was way colder than minus 15 Fahrenheit. Yeah, so I've seen numbers as high as minus 48 Fahrenheit, minus 44 Celsius, wind chill. And, and even, the, the, I don't think it got, I don't think the weather got any better during the game. That's the thing. Weather didn't improve during the game, at least not in a significant way. It was windy. It was overcast. It never got any easier in that respect. I think this is probably one of the first games where, you know, people were talking about wind chill. I mean, now mm -hmm. every storm, people are more accommodated what that means because of the health, you know, in, in recent days, we've seen that across, you know, much of both the countries with wind chill pretty brutal. And people were more aware of it. But at the time, I think it was more innovative. People were thinking about that and to be experiencing, you know, folks from Green Bay, yeah, they're used to seeing cold, windy days. And the fact Not that like that. But this is, for yeah. them, you know, as much as and you see pictures of people in the stands and players on the benches and officials yeah. and, league, and league and team guys around the sidelines, they're bundled up with winter coats and gloves and hats and you, you name it. And you can tell it's the best they have available, but it's just, you know, it's not, yeah. it's not buffering them from frozen fingers, tips, and no, and I mean, the kind of associate one person died. Exposure. Yeah. One person did die. Uh, yeah. It, and again, full, full crowd, uh, which Super Bowl two wouldn't have. So at least you've got each other, you know, so it does sort of help out a bit, but anyway, uh, kicker up for Dallas, uh, kicker and punters, Danny Villanueva, Villanueva, uh, mm -hmm. Probably, I know I'm pronouncing it. Villanueva. Nice, Kirk. Great English. Uh, began the league in 1960. This is also going to be his last game, but this is actually, he became one of the most successful people after this. Uh, he became the part owner of the Spanish uh, International Network, which later became Univision. Mm -hmm. So this guy has done, he did exceptionally well for himself. He's he since passed away, like most people here. But, uh, you know, he was a big philanthropist. Uh, he was doing a on like Spanish language television in LA, uh, he was he was doing like telethons to raise like a what was that Navidad in the barrio, like just <laughs> he seems like a great guy for you know for him to sort of like give back like that. But uh, kickoff goes to uh, Willie Wood, uh, that goes nowhere. And Green Bay starts on their own nineteen. Hands off to Donnie Anderson. We're going to see a lot of him. Uh, he was a Pro Bowler the, the next year when Green Bay mm -hmm. wasn't as good, but. You know, uh, but he, he fumbled and then Chuck Mer Mer Merseille recovered. Uh, I read the two that he was a late pickup uh, this year okay. for, for the Packers. Uh, so he was all set to join Washington. And but then Lombardi had interest and it was like, I can't not play for Vince Lombardi. Right. And, it, and, and we're going to hear more more about him uh, later. Uh, so it gives a. Uh, Goes back to Anderson, gets four yards before he's tackled by Leroy Jordan. I mean, just the names that we're going to be talking to, talking about. Like, ugh. Uh, Anderson gets the ball again. Uh, two yards stopped by Mel Renfro. Again, another giant name, but that's enough for a first down. Starr goes back for the first for his first pass, but uh, George Andre, uh, he was, Andre, sorry, he, he, he was uh, the defensive star of this game, I thought. Yep. Uh, gets through and he gets the first of what's going to be eight sacks for the Cowboys today, mm. unofficial, but eight sacks. Yeah, I mean, it was, again, we don't want to harp on it, but the conditions really messed up a lot of normal play, right? I mean, mm. 
on either side, you know, do you get the footing? Can you keep traction? Can you get leverage, right? And that's why you're seeing a, a lot of these, you know, guys are falling, right? So then we're seeing some, some plays being made on the ground. But on the other hand, I mean, you think, is that always advantage the offense, right? Because they know where they're going. Is, is it going to be harder for the defense? But I think a game like this, it kind of went back and forth. And as you played longer on a field like this, right, it's going to get chewed up. You're going to get some parts of, of the field, right, this, that are a little more open, a little more or less ice, a little more grip. And, you know, guys are slipping and sliding, but other guys are either make, breaking away on runs or sliding between tackles and, and, you know, making a tackle, stopping a guy. Um, a lot of it was just, you know, just the timing and footing and it, you know, both sides of the ball, both teams. I think that sort of played out and um, throughout, throughout the game. I think both, I think it took quite a while, maybe even the full first half for both teams to really figure out and the coaches like, what is going to work? What can we do consistently, right? What do we do when we, want, we, have, we need a big play or a first down? What's going to work? Um, because you see that, right? There's a lot of kind of maneuvering back and forth. And you, know, you see that in big games, kind of feeling out your opponent. But in this case, like, what will the weather let us do? Right. Uh, another thing on Andrew, uh, man, if sacks were credited back then, yeah. uh, according to Pro Football Reference, I, I tend to believe that, uh, he had 18.5. He was he would have been the leader or is the leader of the year before. He had 11 and a half this year. Uh, sacks are probably the sexiest thing a defense can do, even even sexier than, yep. than an interception. It shouldn't be. It should be the other way. But there's just something about a quarterback sack. You know, it's like the dunk. It's like the dunk in basketball. The three pointer actually means more because it's literally more points. But the dunk. You know, like that, that, that's the sexy, that's the sexy thing. Uh, so I think that, we, that would have made a lot of those people much bigger stars than they were. I, I, I truly believe that. Okay. So uh, it's now second and 20 star goes back again, incomplete, uh, but there's an interference call. So there was a couple of pass interference calls, not a whole lot, uh, but yeah. So this gives a uh, green Bay first down on their own 32. Uh, Anderson gets the ball again. And this is a pattern that, I wasn't really used to, uh, I think just in the modern era, where you're gonna run with one running back for a series and then another one for something else, like later on. We don't see that now. Yeah. Like everything's more of like a change of pace where we're gonna try to do that. Here, the thinking was just so different. Yeah, and I'm not really sure the history with that was a sort of a, a, a Lombardi kind of strategy or whether well, we saw Dallas do that too. Yeah, and maybe just health conditions of the game and trying to pace and maybe just trying to figure out, like we were saying a few minutes ago, right? Mm -hmm. What's who are the guys who's who can play through that and and are not letting the cold or the icy conditions slip, you know, bother them? Maybe it's a sort of like counter punch punch to kind of figure out, you know, alternating running backs until I find a guy who's who's the right mix and comfort. Mm -hmm. Um whether if part of it is health wise, right. Just, just trying to, you know, keep a roster together and keep guys playing. <laughs> Maybe, you know, cause you don't want guys sitting on the bench for the, you know, for a long period That's so true too. Get in the game and, and get loose. I don't know, but you, yeah, it is something you didn't notice a lot more today where you tend to go with a, a head better and you stick with it. Maybe a bit of change in pace, but kind of alternating that way is something you don't see a lot of anymore. Well, Anderson gets the ball again, this time on a pass. Uh, so this is something we're used to seeing, running backs who will, pass, who will catch also. Uh, first and 10 on the 47. Gets the ball again, uh, three yards, now he's at the 50. Uh, we're see, like The names that are coming up through Dallas here, Bob Lilly, Jethro Pugh. That is one of my favorite names ever, is Jethro yeah. Pugh. <laughs> I, 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 I don't care... When, when you're going to give your son the name Jethro and his last name's Pew, you already know he's going to be a football player. I, I honestly believe that. It's, it's, it would be such a disappointment if he wasn't. Uh, second and six, uh, Chuck Marison, uh, Mercy, Mer Mercy, no, I keep getting that wrong, uh, gets that, goes for two yards. We've got third and four on the Dallas 47. Uh, I don't know what Star is doing on the next play. He throw and we're not, it's not also not the same era where we're getting different feet, different vantage points. Right. It just looks like he's throwing to nothing. Uh, so, and then the feed that I was watching where they're just showing, here's the bravest people. It's the Packers cheerleaders who are wearing next to nothing. <laughs> well, I mean, not next to nothing, but 
they they were they weren't warmly dressed i'll tell you that my god yeah and um i don't know if they were packers cheerleaders or a local high school because today oh. i think to this day the yeah. don't have what we call traditional cheerleaders but the mm -hmm. back back that far there were a lot of high school or even college you would cheerleaders halftime bands all that kind of stuff um it really wasn't so much the team kind of uh stuff that we see nowadays but but yeah I mean that kudos to anybody who's running around in this game not in a huge you know large coat with large mittens and a big hat covering most of their head <laughs> kudos to those i don't think you see any fans here tearing off their shirts with a big g written on it because <laughs> <laughs> And there's a lot of liquor flowing in that stands, I suppose, too, to keep the keep the. Yeah, uh, after watching that, I, I wanted to go buy some Paps Blue Ribbon because I saw yeah. that everywhere. Yeah, yeah, you know, you got to drink it because you know we got to survive this somehow. <laughs> I, I would have brought in some whiskey for sure, but I mean, like again, kudos Green Bay people. Yeah. Uh, you filled that. Yeah. Everyone went. Uh, what did I read? Uh, Dave Robinson. Uh, he he got a tow truck driver to take him there because his car wouldn't start. And uh, the way he sort of convinced him to sort of like do that is, okay, I'm going to give you two tickets and him and, you know, uh, the, the tow truck driver and his girlfriend said like, yeah, absolutely. That was the other thing I found interesting too, uh, considering that, you know, we think of football as sort of this Neanderthal sport. There was a lot of women in this crowd that I was noticing. You know, but. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is interesting. Cause yeah, you, you think of that era and, you think it's it's sort of men going, but but That's what yeah. I thought it would be more. Yeah, and and yet there is a mix. Um, I don't think it's kind of as family oriented as it is today with the younger kids. But yeah, um, a lot of couples and friends, um, relatives, of course. I mean, the Green Bay fan base is very unique and very much in the community, um, supportive of the franchise. It's it's really unique in that way. And and you know, even to this day, there's a lot of extended families who go to games, you know, with uncles and aunts and grandma, you know, the whole deal. And so it, it's probably a little reflective of that, of that fan base in Green Bay, where it was really seen as a family type event. So husbands and wives, husbands and girlfriends, whatever else is going on there, you know, and, and aunts and uncles. I, I'm and not judging. You know, let's go to the game. Uh, and this yeah. is New Year's Eve, right? And people were still there freezing cold, but they're there to support the Packers. Um, you know, because this is the, pro you know, they're, in the, they're sort of, they're seeing history right in front of them. Mm -hmm. Well, it's no accident that 40% of my fantasy football league are all women who all beat me because I went on a <laughs> six game losing streak to end the season. Yay me. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, back to, uh, back into the playoffs. I went from first to eighth. And then of course I've lost right away. Yeah. So yeah, no, no one cares about my fantasy football, especially me right now. Uh, so where did I? Dun, 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 dun. Okay, so then, uh, so we've got, uh, so we, what do we have? Okay, so first and 10 on the Dallas 42. Uh, first play is a dud. Anderson's tackled for two yard loss by Bob Lilly. Uh, Mercine gets it back to the line of scrimmage, but man, the hits are just, Renfro just, I hate to use the word cut in half because that's obviously not literal, but I'm surprised he wasn't. Uh, third and nine, uh, star goes back to uh, Carol Dale who uh, completes it to the 24. There's another unheralded star of the Green Bay team. Uh, the next three years, he would go to the Pro Bowl, uh, finished his career with 8,300 yards and 51 touchdowns. So obviously pretty good. Unfortunately, his name, first name was Carol. That's a girl's name. <laughs> well, it worked okay, okay for him. Yes, it did. <laughs> I ain't no, I ain't, ain't no Jethro. I mean, I'm going to praise the names I love and I'm going to back the names I hate. I'm equal opportunity. So we got first and 10 on the Dallas 24, uh, went for the end zone incomplete to Boyd Dowler. Uh, Dowler is a name that I was reading a, like a few other things where they said that if he was in a different era, he would be in the Hall of Fame right now. Hmm. Now that's from his teammates, of course, but sure. uh, but yeah, I mean, like Boyd was, well, one, one person called him that generation's Randy Moss. Like, yeah, but he was their star receiver at this point uh pretty good size on him right you know th that he had uh, 
but we're gonna see, we're gonna see more more for him. So it was incomplete, Dollar. It wasn't his fault. Uh, second and ten. This time complete to uh, Dale. Uh, gets to the fourteen. Uh, seven extra yards from a blown tackle. Uh, so we got first and goal. Uh, Anderson for two. So again, it's still Anderson. Second and goal. Uh, Star finds Dowler in the end zone. This time wide open. Uh, what like it was right there. Point after is good. Seven nothing. Uh, one other other thing too. I think uh, Dowler, like a lot of the Green Bay Packers, he was getting older. Uh, this was also a battle not between sort of north and south, but also old young. Green right. Bay was aging out. Yeah. And they limped into the playoffs. They were frankly lucky to be there. But this is also where we see the difference between a playoff tested team and a team that hasn't quite been there yet. Yeah, no doubt. And we, we think of the Packers of this era, right, and all the Giants and, and many Hall of Famers and, of course, the legendary coach Vince Lombardi. Mm -hmm. But you build up – any dynasty that you build that's long enough, and this is like a dynasty that's almost a decade right. old at this point, you, you do, you're still going to have – you're going to have rotation. You're going to have guys moving in and off the roster. You're going to have to find – and I think Lombardi, in addition to being a coach, he could evaluate personnel. He knew it would fit in the, the game he wanted to play. And throughout this dynasty, they are moving pieces in and out as they need to because you just can't build a dynasty and a bunch of guys and hang on. You need all of the working pieces. And, and we've mentioned several names already that probably aren't familiar to most of your average NFL fans, even those with some interest of history may not be aware. But yeah, you, you, in order to sustain a dynasty this great, yeah, core group of great players, but you also need a lot of role players and those guys will come and go. And Lombardi was able to find those players, bring them in and had a specific role. And that played out now that, so that was an 83 yard, 16 play drive. that took nearly nine minutes off the clock. Mm -hmm. So bit by bit, you know, again, they're feel, feeling the, the weather and the ice conditions in the game and they're strategizing against the, the, the events and offense. But that's a massive play to, to begin at a game like this, where you would think oh, maybe, sure. You know that it would be sluggish and they they stall or there'd be a fumble or turnover or you know they'd end up having to punt you know it's, but they went right down the field not easily bit by bit took nine minutes but um, and finished it off and the Cowboys had a couple key penalties against them but yeah still Green Bay was at this point essentially dominating the game. That right sounds like a perfect opening drive in any era. Yeah. You're taking yeah. time off the clock. You're doing things the way you want to do it. Uh, this thing hasn't changed. Uh, it, it was great to watch. But here's something that wouldn't happen in this era. Uh, <laughs> kickoff. Uh, from, uh, the kickoff by Green Bay. And uh, it's kind of muffed. And then it goes out of bounds. And then a rookie named John P Rouser makes a tackle out, out of bounds. That would have been an unnecessary roughness penalty <laughs> for sure. And it's not even mentioned. It's like, not, 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 like nothing. Like that well, maybe there was a ref who didn't want to, you know, blow a whistle and rip his, also rip the lip off his face. Yeah, but not even the commentary is like, well, of course it's Green Bay, so they're not, it was, although, although I found that the, the person doing it, and I, I apologize, I don't remember his name. Uh, I, I found he wasn't being too much of a homer, which is very hard to do when you're essentially employed by the team. Uh, so Dallas is starting at their own 12. And so we have Don Perkins, who was on his fifth straight Pro Bowl. Uh, mm -hmm. He gets the carry, goes three yards, second and seven. Meredith, a uh, short pass to Hayes, who dances the, dances his way to seven yards needed. Uh, so Hayes was great here. And then I, I could be the last time I even mentioned his name. I'm not sure. Uh, but he was fifth in MVP voting. So yeah, this year. pretty good. Uh, first and 10, Perkins again. Gets clotheslined, like literally clotheslined. Correct word of the use, literal, well, except for the point that there is no clothesline, but clothesline uh, by Leroy Caffey. Uh, Perkins gets up again, and then he rushes the next play up for four. What a different era. Uh, yeah. Perkins again does just enough. We've got another first down. So Dallas is trying to punch back. Uh, incomplete in the next play. I don't know. It's hard to tell what happened, but Meredith and Reeves were not on the same page. Uh, they go to a passing formation, but the handoff to Perkins, but he's stuck right away. Green Bay figures this one out. Third and 10, another incompletion. Uh, and it almost gets picked off by uh, Robinson, who we mentioned earlier. 
Uh, so Villanueva, Villanueva, why can't I say that name? No, it doesn't, it doesn't roll off the tongue that easily, that's for sure. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've never sounded whiter in my life than I do right now. <laughs> Danny V. Yeah, there you go. Dan, <laughs> Danny V punts it and, and would, would makes a fair catch, Green Bay ball. Uh, first and 10 on their own, uh, 34. Uh, Mercine gets clocked by Leroy Jordan and just no gain. Uh, second and 10, uh, another incompletion because Dale can't hang on. Uh, Mercine uh, makes a catch for three yards, but that's not enough. Uh, punt, fair catch by Rensel. Uh, we'll be mentioning him quite a bit later. Uh, so Dallas is the ball on their own, 33. Uh, Perkins is stuffed behind the line, uh, but he manages to get just right back to the line of scrimmage. We have the end of the first quarter, Green Bay 7, Dallas 0. Uh, if I'm a Dallas fan at this point, I'm a little worried. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, what, what, again, whether it was the weather, whether it was better prepared, but I, th- I think that an, an, another big aspect of this, right, is you've got a very experienced playoff team. Mm-hmm. A lot of guys who had obviously won NFL championships, strong coaching staff, Lombardi and whatnot. And the Cowboys were still a relatively young team, you know, had only right. been in the playoffs a few times. And, you know, maybe the game at this point was a little bit too big for, for them, at least initially, right? Um, and when you put playing on the road against a hostile crowd and the weather conditions we've talked about, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's a tough, tough, tough haul to be in, but you're in a championship game. You don't get these opportunities. You got to make the best of it. But yeah, they certainly were sluggish and you know weren't able to do. I think what they want on offense yeah. for a variety of reasons. They're up against a very good defense, and and the conditions were not ideal for that. And uh, the Packers, have obviously, you know, with that long drive and the defensive stops, they they were playing their game. Sometimes the best thing in sports uh, is to get punched in the face. Maybe just in life in general. Uh, when you know what a what that feels like, you're not as you already know what the worst thing is going to happen to you. It's like a. I think when we get to this, one of the great ones that we'll probably look at is when the Patriots lo- couldn't finish undefeated, because and they probably would have if they would have suffered one loss, or not undefeated, but they would have won that game. I I truly believe that with all of my heart. Like the best thing that ever happened to the Bears in '85 was losing to Miami. Well, and as you pointed out, right, the Cowboys laid a beating on the Browns in the division off game, just completely crushed them, which would not be the case in the next couple of these seasons. But at any rate, at least, a bit, you know, maybe a little bit of overconfidence, maybe, you know, a little bit of that shrinks, you know, and like you say, when you're facing a really good team on the road in these conditions, a lot of experience there, you, you're going to have to play, bring your best game and the Cowboys at the beginning of this game, clearly we're not for whatever reason. That's also the difference, right, Paul, between like youth and age, right? Uh, yeah. You know, the, the young ones haven't really felt. There's a, there's a line from a fellow Canadian, uh, Getty Lee. We learning that we're only immortal for a limited time. Yeah. They hadn't figured that part out yet, where I think the Packers yeah. had. Uh, I think it's a. I can't believe that's the first time I've ever mentioned, mentioned Rush on a show. Look there you go. <laughs> Finally. Uh, uh, all right. So second and 10 here, uh, incomplete to Rensel. Uh, this was actually Rensel's uh, breakout year, 996 yards, six TDs. So pretty good year. You know, like we don't think of that as that good now, but that's damn good. Yeah. Back then. Uh, he would actually lead the league in touchdowns uh, in 69 with 12 and yards per reception, 22.3. 22.3 yeah. watching this game how does anyone <laughs> average <laughs> well you know, it, you know the passing game you know we we, we you know of course now you know it, it's, it's a lot more short passing it's a lot more move the ball you got the backs you get the tight ends catching balls mm-hmm. but you know back in this era they weren't passing nearly as much but I mean, it's interesting when you look at those stats right there there aren't necessarily a lot of catches at a season or yardage, but there's some big average catch numbers and some big catches because in a lot of cases, yeah, they are throwing the backs on occasion and stuff, but really a lot of the passing is, you know, like throw it deep and cross your fingers, you know, and, and hope for the big bomb that surprises the team that's not expecting it because again, it's still pretty much a run dominated 
uh, offense. And of course, the defenses, as we said before, can really beat up receivers all the way down the field. So the passing game advantage was actually on the defensive side. But we're not, there were these fast receivers, right, with great hands. And so if they got their hands on the ball, and they, if they were open and got open and, and got the hands in the ball in their hands, they were gone. And right. you would see guys, um, and, you know, their speed was there, but just the nature of the game meant you, you could break some big plays if you were a receiver, if you could survive getting yourself down the field mm-hmm. and the back could survive getting the ball to you, <laughs> then you got something. Yeah. Well, uh, the next, well, Meredith didn't have anything because <laughs> Reeves couldn't get, uh, Went for Reeves, couldn't get open enough and incomplete. Wood, uh, Willie Wood almost had an interception. Uh, so Dallas, Dallas is to punt. Green Bay's got it now on their own 36 to start. Uh, so we're going to hand off to Ben Wilson. Uh, so this, this was his last of four years in football. Hmm. Uh, so he didn't uh, do much here, but uh, he, d- he did sort of break out for, for 12 yards and it's first and 10. And then here's a name I, I don't remember. Uh, and I, was, I love looking him up. And unfortunately, it was a tragic end. Uh, Travis Williams, the road runner. Uh, oh. So we came, so we went up the gut for five yards. Uh, so he was a rookie this year. Uh, he's had a pretty good rookie year, uh, mostly doing returns. Uh, four return touchdowns. That's pretty damn good. But he was out of the league four years later due to knee problems. And unfortunately, he became a homeless alcoholic. Mm-hmm. So... You know, it didn't quite end well. Uh, the NFL wasn't exactly good at taking care of their own back then. Yeah, and, you know, a lot of these guys or now football full-time in the season. Yeah. This is an era, and in fact, well into the 70s, right? They, they actually had to work in the offseason to make a living. Mm-hmm. So they were paid a lot. Um, I mean, it wasn't a bad gig in terms of getting paid at NFL, but it wasn't enough really to, to – to, um, you know, it wasn't the kind of wealth we think of today. So, right. And, you know, you know, medical treatment, training, um, preventative injury type of, of, of work and thought was all still pretty early. And, you know, you, you basically just paid, played, banged up, you know, and then the guys who left the game off, you know, we, we hear about it today, but even more so back then, I mean, the struggles with, physical health, you know, mental issues, um, severe injuries that may not, you know, they suffer for the rest of their lives. Um, you know, we hear about, I mean, not so much today, but not too long ago, struggling to get, you know, to get back into a regular society. And I'm sure a lot of that was even worse back then when, you know, your fame and your prestige in these local communities was pretty high. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can walk into any restaurant and bar, you know, get yourself a free drink because you played for the Packers. Right. Uh, so for a lot of these guys, even the, even the, even the greats, right, even the Hall of Famers um, out of these eras, still many of them struggled after. And there's a lot of unfortunate stories about guys who just they just couldn't recapture that. They, they couldn't find their footing in life and then plague with the legacy of, of having played in, in a league where. There just wasn't the, the you know the, the injury care and the health care and preventative training and guys who left with just broken bodies and unfortunately in some cases broken minds and brains over mm-hmm. kind of beating they took um, and you, you you when you watch film like this it's startling for a lot of people to see oh God, yeah. you know, we hear about how rough and hard the game was but to watch it and you cringe at times when, when you see. Yeah, like, just not used to it. You're, 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 you flinch because you're used to the game today and how the players play and then how the rules are set up to protect from a lot of that. And maybe some, we'd argue sometimes maybe a little too preventative. But the reality is there was a lot going on in games back in this era that um, was, was pretty brutal. And as much as we romanticize, right, the era of tough guys and how hard the game was played, I think a lot of us, I mean – folks who are older than us who, who, who certainly saw and ex- experienced the game much more. I think a lot of folks today are, you know, they have fond memories, but I think in reality, a lot of people are looking back, realizing those guys paid a big price. There's some happy medium. I mean, I, I look at this like, and I'm just open jawed, like watching some of this, yeah. but at, at the same time though, it's like, like now we're just so soft, like compared to the yeah. generation that has come up. Like I, I feel yeah. like dirty Harry. 
when I talked to some people who were in their 20s, like, you got to be kidding me. Well, you know, it's that classic, the pendulum, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, it swung so far for so many decades. And it's, 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 a, it's a league advent and media and fans to make it more offensive friendly for a lot of reasons and what happened in the 70s and 80s and of course even more so in recent decades but it's all through television and that's also yeah. why a lot of these guys eventually yep. got paid what they deserve yep. uh, and so i i you know when i watch these kind of games i think it's important for people to understand the context i don't think it's it's i don't i don't feel bad if people are think you know kind of nervous finching and, and shocked at some of the brutality i think that's a reality of it but I also think we have to realize it's history. The game was played. We're not, we're, not a, we're not dissolving all of that. We realize it was brutal, right? But that was the game, and that's how it was played. We don't accept it. We sort of realize that's just the way it was. And I don't think that should take away people's ability to enjoy it like we are and talk. Oh, for sure. But it, it, but, but it, it may it, have been brutal, and we, you know, we may see things that are uncomfortable, that. but yeah. that's just the way it was. Well, Williams gets to the next play, uh, gets into Dallas uh, territory. So it's third and one. And this is, to me, my favorite play of the game, uh, even more so than the one at the end. I, I, I truly believe because I did not see this coming. Uh, you don't because you don't see a lot of these little gadget plays or I wasn't expecting it because, uh, I mean, I, I knew the, the, the end score, knew a few things. But I did not know this play existed, which made this so much more enjoyable for me. Uh, so Star fakes a handoff. Uh, Dallard gets open in the mid in the midfield. Caught the ball at 15, and he was like, "Actually, no, that's not my favorite play. That one's coming up later." But this is one of my favorite ones. Uh, catches the ball at 15. He's untouched. Uh, Renfro eventually get, hits him in the end zone, but Renfro did not have a good game at all. Yeah. Uh, so he was, I, I think, when we had our last committee meeting, right? Because uh, uh, Paul and I were part of this mock committee where we decide who we think should be in the Pro Football Hall. <laughs> And, you know, I, I forget who it was who said, I might, might have been Bill when he came on late. He just said, you know, people just get got. Even the best ones get got. Renfro got got. Yeah, so we've talked and we're going to mention a few more Hall of Famers as we go through this game. But mm -hmm. there are guys in the Cowboys side particularly that think their legacy was really hurt by this game. And you've already mentioned one of them and the reasons why. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's, that's Bob Lit Hayes, um, who did very little in this game. And yes, the keeping but his he hand, did get in the hall. He, he did, but yeah. I think, you know, when people look at his career, his lack of playoff success, which is more than just this game, but this mm -hmm. game kind of highlighted a little bit was was um, held against him. And, and, you know, Renfro as well, um, I mean, he would go on and play and actually win a Super Bowl as Hayes did, the Cowboys did in the 70s. But that's a guy that actually, interestingly enough, I think made the Hall of Fame in his last year as a modern finalist, even though he had over 10 Pro Bowls and multiple All-Pro, including returner, cornerback. But when you play a game like this, and then a decade or 20 years later, right, people are talking about you and your legacy. They don't mm -hmm. forget games like this. And it's not mm -hmm. entirely fair, but we, it's, I think it's worth pointing out they, that those are two guys uh, and there were, they weren't the only ones, but two high profile guys um, who would have great careers, but this game was not, not, they didn't show their best, that's for sure. Right. Yeah. And, and sometimes you have to like, if Dallas didn't sort of like win later with some of those guys, then you get tainted forever. Uh, Bill Buckner, yep. not related to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, Let's just be blunt. The Red Sox faithful never really forgave him until they finally won a World Series. I never forgave Vince Carter until we won the NBA title. I'll admit that. I will say that up and down. And my my closest friend, who's a Knicks fan, uh, and I'm sure he's watching this, he'll be the first to tell you how butthurt I was over Vince forever. Is it like, don't you hate Vince anymore? No, got a title. I don't care anymore. I'm over it. Well, you know, you know, legacies can be very fragile, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you could build a good, strong career and have highlights in it. But you, if you're, I hate to use the expression, but if you're the wrong guy at the wrong time, at the wrong place, as that expression goes, and, and maybe, you know, in this case, Ren Pro what is his fault, or is it a position, whatever the case might be. But mm -hmm. you take these negative hits on, on your legacy, and um, there's nothing you can do. You're going to carry that. You're, you're hoping that the weight of your career eventually, people look at that. But in a game like this, and, and of course, the history of this game and its legacy, right, would just grow with time. And if you look back at this game, you're looking for guys who rose to the moment and guys who so, failed. 
So, just so here, true. here we have then Dowler who gets that touchdown, right? Boyd yep. Dowler got two touchdowns in this in this yeah. game, played a hell of a game. And when you talk about the stars of this game, mm -hmm. is he even the first three that comes up? Yeah, I mean, it's just one of these. Yeah, it's and even if you think about the Packers of this era, right? Mm -hmm. Does his name ever come up? No, no. I mean, a, a true Packer fan who lived the era would be, oh, yeah, I remember him. He was he was a great fan. Yeah, in, in the Ice Bowl, he had a great game. But in the context of the history and everything that surrounds this game and these teams, yeah, guys guys had had good games and were kind of lost to history because of everything else around the game. It's kind of fascinating. And, and even in the final play, well, not the final play, but uh, I guess we'll get there. Uh, so yeah, we will. <laughs> we will. Uh, 14 nothing. Uh, we, we've got 12 minutes left to play. Here's the, the other thing that it's sort of like it's so different too. I remember I remember back when the first time that I saw Fox sort of like have they got football and they showed the time left. And that was so strange. <laughs> and I thought there, there was actually a cartoon the next day in one of the and I guess the Toronto Star. Might not have been Toronto. It doesn't matter. And they were making fun of how Fox had all this stuff there. And then there was like nothing of the actual. Yeah. Can you imagine now without that yellow line saying where the first yeah. down marker is? It's uh, whoever came up with that in Fox, well done. I mean, like you, you guys were brilliant. The blue puck sucked. But anyway. Yeah, boy, yeah. yeah, I mean, if you're watching this game, right, in the stands or on TV, mm -hmm. you really need to be paying attention, right? You need, you need. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not getting, you're getting the commentary, either the radio or the television. So you're picking up some of the, you know, play by play and the commentary and stuff, but you're really going to have to pay attention to follow along. You're really not going to be as aware of down and distance and things like penalties and timeouts and, and uh, uh, stats and, and maybe even, you know, keep track of the score and, and, and where they are in the field at this era. You, you know, if you're watching it, you really got to pay attention if you certainly want to, Enjoy it because you're not getting much other information besides some basic play calling, essentially, which football. is great, but football. that's all you're getting. Okay. Uh, well, uh, this uh, Dallas drive goes nowhere. Uh, they start on their own 35. Uh, Meredith misses again. Uh, the closest person on his first uh, attempt here on this drive was the referee. I don't know what was going on there. Uh, set, uh, Perkins gets gets handed off, and he's like upended by Ray Nitschke. I Again, I thought he was dead. Uh, and then another, another, and then what happened here? Uh, oh, and then it was picked off by Herb Adderley in the next play, who runs it back to the Dallas uh, 32. Uh, again, if, if I was a Cowboys fan, I'm thinking this game's over because there's Meredith is, Meredith was garbage again the whole game, but. That's why you keep playing. Uh, Green Bay's got the ball, so you think, okay, maybe they can do something. They can sort of like pad this lead, but they can't. Uh, first and ten on the Dallas thirty-two. Uh, Wilson gets five yards, but the next one's uh, deflected by uh, Jethro Pew, and then Star is sacked again by uh, George Andre. Mm -hmm. uh, so Dallas with a huge stand, uh, forcing a punt, uh, which nowadays they'd go for a field goal, but even in this brutal cold. The kickers still weren't that good then, especially with noticing that during the punts. Yeah. I mean, no wonder Ray got it earlier, right? I mean, we're not in an era where every team has a regular punter, a regular kicker, guys, right. regular punters and kickers, for example, coming out of college and into pros. They're really still mixed position players. There are a few around the league, but it, it wasn't as valued. It wasn't seen as, as part of the game. And so you're getting sort of, average let's call them everyday kind of players right handling these chores of, of punting and mm -hmm. kicking so the strategy was different in terms of field goals because you just didn't have um guys who were trustworthy to kick even 35 40 yard field goals let alone what we see we today. saw 50 we, yarders we, we being see. Uh, there are some and even punting oh. you know punting was just get rid of the damn ball get it down the field but this whole strategy about you know how much there is behind punting mm -hmm and net gain and hang time directional punting um coverage and all of that it, it this was all none of that was really this were really primary kind of kick the ball as best as you can to the other side and let's go on defense 
Yeah, like you're right. Uh, in terms of, in terms of strategy, to plan, I, I have to. I, man, I wish I knew somebody. Maybe Wayne Mabry, our friend, the Violator, might know some. I, I got to ask him about that because he, he's he might be old enough to remember that, or me, maybe not. I don't know. When his team, the Raiders, drafted Ray Guy in the first round, because I have to imagine back then a lot of Raiders fans are going, "What the hell is this?" <laughs> and that's when back when Al Davis was a genius, yep. not what he devolved into, but. Anyway, uh, all right. So Dallas uh, gets the ball back. Uh, but they're bad field position, starting on their own nine. Perkins got, has no gain, but then gets the ball again, runs rushes for seven. Third and three in the 15, and Reeves gets it, but he loses a yard, so Dallas is to punt again. Uh, but uh, Cowboys are offside, so Villanueva has to punt it really deep in his end zone. That actually worked out better for them. Uh, for that one because he get, actually gets off a better kick and Green Bay starting off on their own 50. Uh, so again, second time Green Bay's got really good field position, but they won't do anything with this. Uh, pass to Travis Williams goes for four yards. And first, first time we're mentioning this guy, Chuck Howley, who probably will get in the Hall of Fame this year, <laughs> finally. Uh, someone I'm huge on, probably not as big as yourself as, as a Cowboys fan, <laughs> but uh, we're both definitely in agreement there with that. Uh, uh, so second and six, uh, Ben Wilson's tackled for loss. Howley again is there. And now we've got third and eight. Uh, Wilson drops it, uh, drops it in the open. And again, so it's just the same guys here, but uh, drops it in the line of scrimmage. Green Bay's got a punt again. And another moral victory for Dallas. Uh, Anderson punts, not really good, takes a Dallas balance, and they will have it on their own 30. First and 10, uh, the rookie halfback, uh, Craig Bainham, comes into the game. Uh, this is going to be his only play, which is a tackle for loss uh, for two yards from Willie Davis. Perkins gets it, go, gets it, goes nowhere. And same with the third down, pass to Hayes, who's stuck at the line of scrimmage. So every moral victory is just taken away from them. Uh, Villanueva has his best punt thus far uh wood takes it uh from the 20 though to the 33 and we have a legal procedure yes. uh so we got a first down so we have a first and uh on green bay so first and 15 star goes back the line breaks uh the packers offensive line did not have a good game protecting star at all yeah i mean you mentioned you mentioned a couple guys on on the cowboys of line and of course the active linebackers with with Howley and with uh, Leroy Jordan. And so the, the Cowboys were a very, very good run defense mm -hmm. and um, very active, smaller than we think about today. These guys were a lot smaller, but um, even, but fast, agile. And if you, you keep mentioning Pew and, and Andre um, as guys who were making plays. Why mm -hmm. were they making plays? Because uh, the Packers were terrified of Bob Lilly. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have, I don't think he had to read a high profile in this game because they, they were, if not had two guys on him, they had three guys. I mean, he was tying, this is part of a lot of his career as well. Right. And, um, but that messes up what you're trying to do, right. An offense, when you're, when you're focused on one guy like that, you're dedicating two guys, right. To slide over and make sure he's blocked. It's going to create havoc for the rest of your offensive line. And it's going to create lanes and openings, right. For guys who are fast and agile, um, like Andre and Q, and you see the result, you know, stuff plays in the, in the sack. So yeah. And, the, and that's what happened here. The line of the Cowboys was actually keeping them in the game. Yeah. Really. And then offense, and, nothing was happening. And then defense gets the touchdown. Uh, Larry Stevens forces the fumble, which back when that wasn't a stat. And uh, Andre, uh, have I been pronouncing it wrong this whole time? No. You got it. Uh, so he scoops it up and scores. We've got a ball yep. game. Uh, three minutes, three minutes and forty seconds left, and we got our first. I think our first touchback. Uh, Green Bay with the ball, we'll, but they're not doing anything here. Uh, Williams rushes for a yard. Uh, another incompletion. Offside Dallas, but then, but Bart Starr is sacked again. This time by Jethro Pugh. Uh, Hayes get, does the fair catch. Dallas has the ball. Uh, Reeves rushes for two. And then an end around play to Frank Clark, but Green Bay's got it scouted out, and that's a tackle for loss for seven yards. 
Uh, the commentators, uh, the, what I was listening to, apparently, like this has worked quite a bit for Dallas all year. Not this time. Uh, yeah. This was Frank Clark's last time rushing in his entire career. Uh, he began his career in 57 with Cleveland, uh, but at 5,000 career yards, so not too bad, but I'm going to mention his name again. Uh, so thankfully not his last play. Uh, third and long, and Meredith again misses. Uh, what was Meredith's overall stat line in this game? I, uh, I think he only was five for 10. Oof. Uh, and let me check and, and, uh, 59 yards, 59 yards. So yeah. Um, not too good. There was one big pat pass pass play. We'll get to that later, but yeah. Um, another guy who, this, this was a guy who was among the top quarterbacks in the league at the time. Um, and did not play very well. And I think after the game interviews, he was distraught about it and upset and he took the blame and he didn't blame the weather or anything. He just, he just, uh, just I didn't play very well and uh, give him credit for that. Um, these two games against Bay were really, you know, Meredith played really well in the first one. Now we're talking about the second one the next season. Um, but they, they would cement his legacy one way or another, at least as a player. But yeah, he did, he did not have a good game. Um, at all, which um, made it even tougher given the conditions. Plus, playing a team like Green Bay, your quarterback's got to step up and I mean, not maybe not have a, a, a the kind of game we think about today quarterbacks having. But you got to do better than five for ten and fifty some odd yard, fifty nine yards. Just not going to. Yeah, and we're not talking about any of these passes being the receiver's fault either. You know, because you know you can see a quarterback go ten for twenty and then you have five drop balls. This is not the case here. Yeah. Meredith was not accurate at all, but sometimes, as they say, it's better to be lucky than good. That's true. <laughs> Willie Wood, Willie Wood, who is one of the stars of this game, was not yep. here. He muffs it, and Dallas recovers. Uh, so Perkins rushes for two. Uh, Meredith incompletes to Rensel. Uh, Pastor Reeves goes nowhere, of course, but it's a field goal attempt, and this one is made. We've got so it's fourteen ten Green Bay. Uh, short kick to Villanueva, uh, by Villanueva, Villanueva, sorry. And, but, you know, nothing really goes here. Williams rushes for nothing. We got halftime. Uh, thankfully for all the people in the crowd, because it was so cold, <laughs> they didn't have to watch the marching band. There you go. Yes. So, yeah, the Dallas offense went the entire second quarter without gaining a first down. Mm -hmm. uh, but those two turnovers by Green Bay were costly and led to those 10 well, it's all turnovers, yes. right? Yep. Uh, which is the adage, right? You know, turnovers can kill you. Um, mm -hmm. You can be, oh, in this case, yeah. I mean, the Packers were clearly outplaying the Cowboys on both sides of the ball. It was a close game. Um, they weren't necessarily running all over the field on them, but, but clearly the Packers were playing better and had the edge. But, yeah, two critical mistakes with those turnovers that the Cowboys were able to turn into points. Like you said, made this a 14-10. We got ourselves a game at halftime. Yeah, I, I think it was Meredith who I, I remember what he had in the first half because he said that, but you two completions in the first half. Yeah. That's it. And you've got 10 points. If you're Dallas, you're thinking like, because just like 10 minutes ago, you're thinking they're done. And now you're lucky. Okay, we have a shot. We have a puncher's chance. And then as we get to the third quarter, I mean, like it looked, it, it swung the other way. That's why I love sports so much. Just the way this can happen. Uh, Green Bay starts it uh, deep in their own territory, uh, but they're not really going anywhere with this. Uh, it, it's a dead drive at the start, uh, an incompletion to uh, Dowler on, on third down, and they got to punt it right away. But uh, we're not seeing much here. The third quarter is pretty much, it's a dead quarter, let's be blunt. Um, Cowboys fumbled on the punt, but they were able to recover. Uh, Meredith Reeves for seven yards. Uh, Perkin gets it to the 26. Then Reeves drops it. Actually, I, 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 do, I do take that back. I'd said that Meredith, uh, there was no drops, but uh, I've got here one that there was. So Reeves did drop the ball. Uh, Clark gets a reception to the 39. Uh, we have first down. So Dallas is doing something, but it's not going to go anywhere, unfortunately. Uh, Reeves, Reeves rushes to the 32, then 29. It looks pretty good. We got a completion to Rensel, but then Reeves is tackled for a four-yard loss. Meredith can't find anyone in the end zone, fumbles, and uh, Adderley picks up, uh, gets the ball. So, like, this was the probably the best drive Dallas had 
Well, yeah. not really the best. Well, it was the most consistent drive. And uh, Green Bay's got the ball back. Uh, I believe that's his second turnover. Uh, but Green Bay can't do anything here with this. Uh, two rushes that go nowhere. Uh, Star passes to Dale, gets a first down. But then Star is sacked again by, uh, by George. Just third and 19. And they got a punt again. Uh, Dallas has got uh, some good position. Uh, fair catch at the 46. Reeves has his best run of the game, gets to the Green Bay 35. Uh, swing pass to Reeve, only two yards. And then I, I wrote down, Nitschke destroys Dan Reeves. <laughs> I don't know how he got up. I, I don't know how it's possible. Not only does he get up, he gets the ball for the next, like, I, I don't know what I'm watching. Uh, Dan Reeves, I don't know if it was this play. I don't think it was this play, but he said he got a scar from getting crunched in that, like uh, from from, the, from the, his helmet going like into his face. Right. That every time he'd shave, he'd see that scar. Wow. Like, yeah, these guys were a different different breed, right? I mean, uh, generation. These guys were they were tough, and that was the way the game was played. If you wanted to play the game, and that he, it's just he's just sort of what came with the territory on both sides of the ball, and. They were tougher, but they had to be tougher. That was the only way the game was played. Yeah. Um, These guys didn't go to the hospital, but the band members did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and, I mean, the, the you know, frozen temperatures and the frostbite and all that is, it was way beyond what any player should put up with. But the, the brutal nature of the game, as we spoke about earlier, was the way how the game was played. And there's no complaining to the officials about it. There's no going off the field whining about it. You suck it up. You, you either learn to tolerate it, put up with it, and play – after play game after game season after season or you're, you're just you're out of the league you don't want to play you want to, you walk away they, these guys were they knew because i'm getting at is they knew what they were getting into they knew the kind of game was being played it was brutal and you see guys were taking hits and, and i'm sure they they feel pretty sore and and uh but they're up they jump back up and the game goes on yeah well yep. Reeves, uh, gets it to the 29 uh he gets blasted again this time by Willie davis <laughs> Third and six, uh, Meredith is then sacked by Leroy Caffey. Meredith never saw it coming. Uh, so we've got a 46-yard field goal attempt. And I would, which, okay, so two things on this. Uh, first, I, 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 I'm so not a historian at all, as much as I thought. When did they have, like, the field goal, like, the uprights, like, right in the middle like that? And when did they move that back? I never remember it not like that. Like, what am I watching? CFL here? Uh, yeah, I, I actually read a story about this recently. And somebody was commenting about whether the ball hits it, is it live? But they were talking about when it was moved back mm-hmm. to the back, and to the end, back of the end zone and, and um, late 60s, early 70s, maybe. So, yeah, and it, it, it is bizarre. I mean, it's one of the things you have to adjust when you watch games right. era and you realize it's a dead ball when it hits it. But man, the damn thing's in the way. <laughs> <laughs> a year ago, a year after this, they put a guy's running in into it. I mean, it's just crazy to think why in the world didn't they put it at the back to begin I with? Know. I mean, um, a year later, <laughs> the US put a man on the moon, but they couldn't figure out how to make yeah. an upright that would go a little bit deeper. They, they couldn't yeah. figure that one out. Uh, but yeah, this here's another thing I, I was thrown off by. Uh, so the field goal doesn't even come close, it's actually returned. Yeah, I did not know that was possible. Mm-hmm. It's so, still possible today. Um, you just don't see it a lot because, of, like you said, yeah. usually nowadays when field goals are short, they're falling short, right, and then they bounce out of bounds or they're lot, you know, wide left, wide right, whatever. So, but you remember the game a few years ago, right? Auburn and Alabama, and Auburn won that, that famous game. Um, yeah, yeah. Alabama went for the long field goal, and it was short. And both team both teams had their kick teams on, so a, a, a fast, small guy picked up the the missed field goal and zigzags his way through at the end of the game. Win the greatest college football player play I have ever seen live on TV. Watching it to see that happen. So yeah, it, it is something that happens occasionally but back in this era we mentioned earlier like field goals were not like they are today you know going for a 46 or 47 yard field goal i haven't looked at it but that seems like a high risk low probability type of call i don't know whether you know 
Danny V, as we can call him, um, whether that was in his range or not. But that seems, given the conditions, but also that the era, that seems like maybe a questionable strategy to go for the 75-yard field goal. But again, we're talking about the Cowboys are still behind in the game, right? And, and maybe the thought is odds are worth taking a shot because three points to get us right, right to where we – you're also believing on your defense too, right? Because Dallas, yes, which which is yeah, yeah, you're right. That's probably part of the sound strategy. Figure if he misses it, I got a solid defense. Mm-hmm. They, they can they, they can handle. They're playing well. We're getting the sacks. We're getting the rush. Um, that's probably another part of the strategy, no doubt. Is this confidence that your defense is going to keep you in the game even if you missed it? Which in fact, as we see, they did. Yeah, because uh, yeah, so. Uh, Wood returns at the 27, and this goes nowhere. Anderson gets the next, the first two rushes, and then stars sacked again. Uh, yeah. This time by uh, Leroy Jordan and Dave Edwards. I think that's the only time I'm going to say his name uh, today. And so they got to punt it. Uh, so three and out, uh, fair catch by Hayes, uh, first and 10 on the Dallas 45. So in the, in the gate, in the battle of field position, which is becoming, you know, the momentum is yep. it's staying with the Cowboys. Uh, Perkins gets a five yard, uh, rush to midfield. And then we have the fourth quarter. Uh, and then this is what I meant to say. This is my favorite play of the game. Yeah. Mine too. (laughs) I know what's coming. (laughs) Yeah. So it's, it's a gimmick play, which I don't even, I didn't even know this existed back then. So pitch out to Reeves who makes the best pass of the game. Yeah. It's a wide open Lance Renzel. Uh, they were, their pants were down. It's a 50 yard touchdown pass. And you can't hear it, but you have to figure that the, the air in that crowd in Green Bay has to be just completely deflated. So apparently one of the kind of innovations or tricks that land, I mean, Reeves was a multi-purpose kind of guy, right? Mm-hmm. He, the reason he played as much as he did, I mean, he's, he wasn't a big, fast running back, but they used him as a running back, but he was a running back who could catch the ball. And this was the other threat. This is not the first time he's done this in his career. And so that, yeah, they kind of caught him. But the, the little wrinkle that apparently they built in is the Cowboys ran the play to the left side, figuring that Green Bay would be caught off guard because Reeves was right-handed. And so you're actually moving the play opposite okay. to the hand. So uh, probably a little switch up from what they normally had. If the Packers had ever seen this on film, which I suspect that they did, because, again, this was not Reeves' first – um, halfback option pass but that little wrinkle meant that side of the field was open and as you say 50 yard touchdown uh, and it wasn't Meredith that's really so, so if we were gamblers this would be great when I get that gambling sponsor uh, who would have had Meredith uh, or not Meredith who would have had Reeves as getting that uh, touchdown pass would have had pretty good odds yeah and you know we said before total in the game Meredith passed for 59 yards mm-hmm. Reeves just passed for a 50 yard touchdown <laughs> so yeah it's, it's it's a quirky thing of the game but um it worked and they they took a 17 14 lead on the, the what was the first play of the fourth quarter would you say yeah. yeah uh so green bay's got the ball they're confused uh incomplete pass to dowler but pass interference called so they got first and 10 on the 48 um racine gets to the handoff for no gain star sacked again uh Andrew, uh, Andrew and Lily. Uh, so this is the eighth, but final sack. Uh, Stars' next pass is then batted down by Leroy Jordan, and it's another punt. Uh, goes untouched. Dallas get the ball back on their own 19, and this doesn't go anywhere. Perkins rushes for one. Reeves tackled for loss. Uh, Meredith, of course, is incomplete to Hayes. Punt again. Uh, Wood ru- Wood runs fr- from the 40, out, but then he actually goes. He has to go backwards, but a face mask call, a yep. blatant face mask call, uh, moves it to the Dallas 47. So pretty good field position. We'll see what they can do with it. Well, not much. Uh, Star threads in. This is, I thought, one of his best passes here. He threads it into Dowler, who, from the vantage point I saw, looked like there was like, as soon as he got it, there was like five Cowboys right there. So that I wish there was a better yeah. of all that. Anderson rushes for a yard. Stars almost sacked again. Uh, this time it's Howley who's uh, working, who's, who's rushing. Uh, but he bats away a throw that probably Star should have just thrown somewhere else in a different direction. Uh, luckily, Howley's 
luckily for him, Howley's instinct was to just bat it down as opposed to try to catch that, which is sort of against against tight based on his position. So tactic, I, I, I thought that he was very lucky there. Uh, then the star throws to Anderson and there's three Packers running and none of them even look back. <laughs> so I don't know what happened there. <laughs> like, ah, yeah, just no one was on the sloppy. same page there. You know, things were getting sloppy. Um, you know, we see it off and on during the game and, and you mm-hmm. see it. And I don't know whether, you know, the, the weather was just wearing these guys down, the pounding, whatever it was, but it, it it was it was a sloppy at times in this game. There's there's no and you know yes we're we're realizing the weather conditions. The field was terrible, right? Contributed. You mentioned about the ball itself it must have been like throwing a brick. I mean, and catching a brick. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's all part of it. But it 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 was a sloppy game at times, um, misplays and and uh, turnovers and sacks and whatnot. I mean, some of that is good good defensive play, good strategy, but other times it was just, it was a little sloppy at times. There's no doubt about that. Well, speaking of sloppy, Chandler goes for a field goal from the 40. It's not even close. Yeah, it bounces so. at the two. Uh, here's where I, I'm still confused here. So Dallas gets the ball back, but on their own 20. So how does it start at the 20 and not at the point of where? It I, I do not know. Yeah, I don't know what. I guess the rules change at some point, so I, I, I'm confused. Mm, that's interesting. Well, Perkins rushes for five, then another, then one, third and four. Perkins, again, avoids a tackle for loss, but can only get two yards before, again, Ray Nitschke, just if he's going to hit you. What a scary-looking man. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't matter because Green Bay's offside, so Dallas gets a break, first and ten. Reeves rushes at 36, but on the next play, he slips, uh, Reeves slips, and we're talking about the weather, and he's tackled for a six yard loss. Uh, then I guess this is Frank Clark's last play. He gets on a third and 10, he gets it to the 41. Dallas, Dallas is trying to crush the soul here of uh, Green Bay. So they got a first and 10, uh, time's running out, uh, but eh, still so, it didn't quite go that way. Perkins rushes nowhere. Pass to Greg Bainham, who slips behind the line, loses two yards. So here's Craig Bainham's uh, slash, li- uh, slash line, uh, stat line. One reception, one rush, both for losses of two yards. <laughs> yeah, not a good day. <laughs> not a good day, no. Um, the very good thing is he got in the game, he got to run around, he wasn't sitting on the bench freezing. <laughs> there's game. that, yeah. That, it wasn't very good. <laughs> I wonder how many of these cheerleaders lost fingers from frostbite. I, I've got to do <sighs> that out. I'm still stuck on that. I, I can't believe Yeah, it. it's kind of astounding. Yes. Uh, on the next play, Meredith, who, now he slips, but he still managed to get the ball away for an incompletion, so he avoids a sack. So, you know, he might be playing, not, not playing well, but he still got the quarterback instincts. He's still a pro. Uh, so now we're punting and wood gets uh nine yards to the 32 green bay starts first and 10 on their own 32 um is this their last drive yeah we got about four yeah. just, just under five minutes left in the game yeah and is even worse at this point um i don't know whether to be measuring during the game but they're talking about minus 70 degree fahrenheit minus 57 degrees celsius <laughs> you know it's bad with fahrenheit <laughs> So it, the point we were making earlier, it did not get better. I mean, the okay. conditions of this game, the field is probably even worse than it was when they started because it's all chewed up and still frozen solid. But the wind is whipping around. Um, everybody's feeling this. And we got less than five minutes to go in a, a very, very close game with, you know, the championship on the line. I think that's the other thing, too, that's sort of interesting. So, like, if you see – now a, a game now right and it's uh team a is down three points and it's five minutes left to play you don't think of them just sort of like eating out the entire clock to uh to end a game but, but that's kind yeah. of what we had here that does not happen very often today uh play action pass to anderson for six and racine rushes out of bounds to the 45 so we got a first down uh, Dowler gets another first down. He is thrown down hard. He has to exit the game. He did come back, but he, I think that's the last time. Like it, it was brutal. It looked like a back suplex. I, 
Yeah. Like really, really hurt. Like that. My, I, I don't know how he even walked off on his own power, but he did. Uh, but first down on the Dallas 42. Uh, momentum's halted. Uh, Anderson's tackled for a loss of eight uh, by Willie Towns. But they're giving the ball back to Anderson again. Uh, so I'm on a pass. He gets it back to the 39. So we've got third and seven and then the two-minute warning. And I was actually wondering, like, I wonder if they still have the two-minute warning. I, I wasn't even sure. So, which they Apparently did. part of the strategy, the Packers were picking up on it at, for this drive um, was that the Cowboys linebackers were paying, playing back a bit further, and they start, Packers started to pick up on the fact that they could start hitting these shorter passes on these dump passes and be able to gain seven, eight, nine yards. Um, and it's not, they weren't really in a prevent defense or anything like that. It's just the way that the, the, the setup was, and they just know to say they had a, mm. a apps here. They can get some short dump passes to the backs and kind of just, inch, like you say, they were inch, literally inching or yarding their way down the field. Um taking up the clock, marching down the field. But this is, you know, this was the pot Packers kind of strategy, and this is the strength the team had. They weren't a, a big play to team necessarily, a lot of, but it was really, you know, perfection, execution of, of, of the playbook and being able to do something like this. When you take the ball and you mix the plays up and you use the strategies, you take advantage of the weaknesses you're seeing, and you just sort of march yourself down the field. And when you think about it, you know, the where where this game was, the score of the game, where we are with the time left, the conditions, it's a wise approach, right? You just we're gonna burn the clock down and get ourselves in a situation either to tie the game or win the game and not take any risks. And we know everybody's kind of beatered by the weather and and but just to kind of work their way down the field very strategically, use the time up, don't make any mistakes, don't turn the ball over and um, get ourselves in a position, which is what the Packers clearly were doing. And I'm sure there was frustration on the Cowboys side that we just couldn't stop them. They were just, you know, bit by bit moving down the field. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Anderson gets the pa pass again, uh, breaks up, breaks the tackle and gets to the 30. So just gets just a, gets another first down and uh, star passes to Mer Mersin who gets it. This, this was his, uh, I guess his best moment really in football. Uh, he gets a 19 yard, a lot after the catch, staggers out, out, out of bounds. Uh, the emotion that you could just sort of like see rubbing off of him is incredible. So we have first, first down at the 11, a minute 10 to play. Uh, Mercy, they're giving the hot hand. So Mercy gets a lot of the ball, ball again, up the gut for three yards, timeout, 54 seconds. Uh, Anderson gets it up the middle, gets a first down. Uh, so we've got first and goal on, was it the three? Uh, I think it's on the one, around the one yard line. Uh, or is this the even play before? I, I, I think it's the next two plays. Because Anderson- yeah, sorry, you're right. Out. Yeah, because Anderson gets it again, gets yep. nothing. Uh, timeout, 20 seconds left. You see Star uh, confer with Lombardi. And then from what I was reading before, it's a, it made it sound like that was the next play but, the, but it wasn't actually because uh, Anderson gets the rush again, makes progress, but not in, although footage sort of shows that he probably yep. was. Yeah. Um, no one's replay. There were Cowboys on the field who thought Anderson had scored and they, their mindset was already thinking about, well, we need to get the ball back and, and, and we need to, right. we can do, but yeah. Um, so there was a, and again, you know, people have to remember this is, Pretty much one camera, maybe two camera footage being shot in the game. We're not getting all these angles. We're not getting, you know, we're not getting an instant replay. But even just the, the camera and the view of the field that the fans are watching on TV, um, this sort of thing was probably not uncommon, right? To have a play like this that was that close that could have went either way. Um, but there's really no way of knowing. The, the officials just called it. In this case, they said that he missed it by probably just a you know half less than a, less than a yard and wasn't a score. And so the game is, is still going. Um, Cowboys still up by three. But, but this goes back to what you were saying earlier, right? So like, this is where legends are born. Anderson would have been a legend. Yep. If he puts that, if he gets credit for that touchdown and he then becomes that person, because Donnie Anderson had a decent career, but he was not, he's not a, a is he a Packers legend? No. Yeah. I don't yep, think right. so. But then he would become one because Dallas probably isn't going to come back in 20 seconds. Yeah. 
You know, like that's not a they weren't built for that. Well, no football yeah. team was built for that back then. Well, not in this game and this conditions. Yeah. It, it, right. So and this is going to be the game right here. Well, there's going to be two people who, and I, I, I just blanked on, and I had all my notes here and now I didn't write down the name of the, of the Packers center. Um, yeah. I can't remember off the top of my head either. All right. That's all right. I'll just start to put a little graphic later. Um, uh, Ken Bowman. Thank you. Yes. All right. Because. I just found my notes here. Right. Great. So like on the next play, uh, this is where, where everything sort of becomes legendary. Um, everyone's expecting this. Everyone's expecting it's going to go to, uh, it's going to be another rushing play, which it was, but not the way we thought it was going to be. Uh, Bart Starr never did, or very rarely did quarterback sneaks. So Right. So we're at, we're at third and goal, right? Yeah. Two foot line. We got 16 seconds remaining. Um, Packers took a timeout. Star goes to sidelines, talking to Lombardi, you know, trying to figure out what they want to do here. Later on, um, uh, Landry after the game would say they kind of expected a rollout pass attempt because that way an incompletion would stop the clock, allow the Packers to kick one more play on for fourth down, and they, they would either go for the touchdown win or they kick the field goal right and send it in. They used their third timeout. Sorry? They already used their third timeout. Yeah, yeah. so that's why they're thinking – you know, um, a run is going to be a risky play, whereas if you try a pass, you get the touchdown, or you have fourth down, and then you make the decision, you just get the field goal and tie it. In it. Although I don't think anybody wanted this game going into overtime, but no. that's the situation we're at. So it was a bit of a chess game here, right, between two yeah. teams on both sides, um, yeah. being through what the options here, and we'll take it away. What what happened? Well, uh... <laughs> Bart Starr keeps it. Uh, there is a block of, who were they double teaming? Was that Lily? Uh, yes. Yeah, so it's Bowman and- uh, Actually, and, no, sorry. Kramer and Bowman were double teaming on Jethro Pugh. Jethro Pugh, yeah, right, okay. And this is yeah. where the legacy kind of comes in. You've already mentioned he's had a pretty good game, right? But mm -hmm. this is the legacy, unfortunately, he's going to be left with. Right, and so- not only does Star get in easily, he probably could have rushed for four yards the way that, that all worked out. It's an incredible play. It's where we talk about legacy, then Kramer gets a lot of the credit for the block. And I'm a little biased because I, I did get to speak with Jerry Kramer, actually. So he's one of the cool. first interviews I, I ever did for the site. Uh, saying that though, Kramer took more of the credit for it, whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. Uh, Pew is of the belief that Bowman did more, a, a bigger piece of him. But Kramer was the person who came out with the book. He was the person who yes. came out with, uh, and not that he's a self promoter, he just wrote a book. I, 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 right, I so, and his, I, I, we keep talking about legacy, but it's a game of legacy. So mm -hmm. can't really avoid the fact, you know, and as we all know, it took Kramer a long time to get in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Even though he had a lot of accolades, not just this game, but as a player in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And there was talk for many, many years that you just mentioned it, you know, sort of the self-promoting, writing the book. And maybe this play was part of that kind of the myth being created and how much of that came from him and how much it was reality. And there was, you know, again, there's been some speculation that some of the voters especially when he was a modern candidate in the 70s and into the 80s, held this against him. And that's why he never got elected as a modern. And then he fell in that senior pool where it was very hard to get out at the time for many, many years when he was a candidate. There was only one a year. And, and, and that, this, you know, finally he did, after I think 30, 40 years, whatever it was, he got elected in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And even to this day, there, there's still some folks you talk to that think, eh, okay, but you know, some think that he was a bit overrated. And yeah, uh, it's an interesting angle to that. I, I'm not personally attacking him at all. I mean, it's done with your view and things of that nature. Just an interesting little aside to his, you know, this play cemented that sort of legacy for him, but it's been a kind of a bit of a controversial one, at least in some people's mind. Although it is portrayed as such, right? The block, the, you know, the gravity and the history of the event is sort of overwhelmed all the rest of this. And it is what it is. He, he was there. The two players blocked Pew, Pew, slipped, and yeah, start got in, and that is the game. I, I think what also sort of like plays a factor into the Hall of Fame stuff, in my opinion, uh, 
you have a lot of writers who are part of, who are part of those committees now and then. Uh, a lot of them might have been the same people who would have voted him on the 50, 50th anniversary team. Yep. Now, Jerry Kramer becomes a writer who's got a bestseller, and you don't. I don't know if that plays a little bit in your ego. Yeah. It's my... It's yeah, my, it's, my, it's a complicated vote. kind of legacy of that. Um, people vote on people. And, yeah, and, and people view things differently, and, and legacies, and history, and how people view certain things, how people play up their role. And again, I'm not, I don't mean to be disrespectful to Jerry Kramer at all. Um, there's just different views. And it, it, I think it's, it's safe to say the views have been very contentious on this and, and his role in it. But history shows you watch the film. He was there. He made a play and Star got in, scored the touchdown mm -hmm. and the Packers win the ice bowl. Yeah. You know, and also too, I mean, I'm, I'm watching this. It's also the same line that let eight sacks happen. Yeah. So, and you know, that can, you know, all, you've, you've highlighted that, right? We yeah. talked about it earlier, the defensive line for the Cowboys played a really good game in a lot of respects. Oh, well, for sure. But, you know, um, the Packers were able to do what they do best and work down that field and get themselves in a position to mm -hmm. in the game. And they called up because they were punched in the face right before they knew they knew. Yep. Like, and I mean, the, the game's not over at this point. I mean, the fans rush the field, but I mean, they get everyone off. So, you know, kick off to the end zone. Uh, Meredith overthrows Rensel deep because, of course, he does. Yeah. Uh, and it wouldn't have mattered anyway, even if Rensel caught it because they had 12 men on the field. Uh, seven seconds left on their own 15. And of course, one more bad throw. Not even close. Game over, fans flood the field, and somebody stole Vince Lombardi's hat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I do recall hearing that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, um, yeah, one of those things where it's just, it's all of the, the hours of the game and all of the conditions and the historical situation that we're in, and it just, it, you know, it goes on even after the final score. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it, the Packers would, they, they, this was their third consecutive NFL title, remember, this is before the merger. Um, and they were the first team to do that in a playoff structure. Um, the Packers in the 20s and 30s had won three, but there was no postseason at that point um, right. in the NFL. And, you know, just to sort of highlight, I mean, yeah, I mean, the players suffer. There are players today, and there's a lot of great um, oral history and interviews of a lot of these yeah, players. Yeah, yeah. And they always ask them, you know, how, how are the conditions and how you feel? And there were, you're here player after player who will tell you to this day, they still think they have physical remnants of um, playing in such a bad, you know, sensitivity to cold. I mean, there were number, numerous players got severe and coaches got severe frostbite on their fingers, their face, their nose. Um, you know, things we just, we don't, we don't think like, uh, today, but yeah, they, this was a, a brutal game. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, that, that's part of the, the legacy. The other part of the legacy is, okay, they, they won this championship game. And the part of that is that it wasn't the final game, right? It, they went on to the second Super Bowl, Super Bowl two, although it wasn't called the Super Bowl at the time, it was called the world championship between the NFL and the AFL. Um, they went and they played the Raiders and completely dominated that game and won the, the second uh, Super Bowl. So they the, won the first and the second. Um, and Lombardi in the offseason would move into the GM position and then eventually move over the Redskins. And unfortunately, he, he passed away only a f you know, short time, a few years after this game. Mm -hmm. But that, that, is, that is the legacy. And this, this game, plus, of course, it has to be concluded by winning that Super Bowl, right? To kind of tie the bow on top. Mm -hmm. That is the long, that's the, the Green Bay Packers, the sixties. This, this is Lombardi era. Um, all those, those players and many of which we've mentioned um, that really was for them the, the peak. Um, and so the hall of famers on the Packers side, right? You got Lombardi, Bart Starr, Forrest Gray, Willie Wood, you mentioned had a great game. Jerry mm -hmm. Crane talked about him. Willie Davis, Ray Nitschke, you mentioned him. Uh, Henry Jordan, Herb Adderley. By the way, Herb Adderley um, would join the Cowboys in the early 70s and actually be a key veteran to help them get over the hump. Talk about that in a minute and eventually win their Super Bowl, Super Bowl VI. Uh, and Dave Robinson. So 
Packers, this is their legacy. This game in that Super Bowl really is for them the peak. For the Cowboys, um, it's unfortunate in the sense that this is the second year in a row, well, within the same calendar year, to lose the NFL championship. Um, they would stumble in the playoffs the next couple of years, both years losing to the Cleveland Browns um, unexpectedly. Um, and those would have been, those two games would be the end of Don Merrick would walk away from the game in the late sixties after those two other playoffs, they got the title next year's champions, which is actually the title of a book that was made years later. Um, and they got this sort of tag hanged on the coaching staff, Tom Landry and all the players, they couldn't win the big one. Mm-hmm. Until um, they did. Second NFL championship. Then they had the two playoff next couple seasons. Uh, then 1970, um, Meredith and Perkins retired. Um, Stallback would join the team as a rookie, um, even though he'd been in the military for four years. So he was an older rookie. And he's mm-hmm. um, but Craig Morton would be the quarterback. They'd have many of the same players we've been talking about are still around in this game in the 70s. Uh, but of course, in 1970, they lose Super Bowl five on a last minute field goal. They were playing the then Baltimore Coats, and Jim O'Brien did that famous field goal at the end of the game. The only Super Bowl, by the way, which we know, the MVP was a defensive uh, player on the losing side. That was Chuck Howley, uh, who was the best defensive player, actually the best player in Super Bowl V. And so they would carry that legacy until the following season in 1971, where um, midway through the season, uh, Laundry made the historic decision to turn over the reins um, to Roger Stallback partway through the season who then got him on a roll, got him in the playoffs, and um, they would go on to, of course, win Super Bowl VI against the Miami Dolphins in a convincing way. Um, and many of the guys we've talked about, key players on the defensive side, especially um, for the Cowboys, would play long enough to, to win that Super Bowl. Holly, Lily, um, uh, Andre, Pugh. Um, Renfro uh, too, right? Yeah, all these guys, you now Renfro they all played long enough to get to that championship game, but for for their legacy coming out of this game was different than the Packers. The Packers were cementing that legacy as a great, one of the greatest dynasties in NFL history. And that, that legacy exists to this day. Um, And the Cowboys, another frustrating loss, a team trying to make that next step. It couldn't and actually would not for another four seasons, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, it took, it took a long time to emotionally recover from that. Uh, no. And it's not even like you can get up to get to, because the Packers weren't the same. Uh, they didn't even make the playoffs the next couple of years, I can believe. I could be wrong on that. So it's not like you could get your revenge and get mentally psyched up to, to go up against that. And yeah, they... they it, it, it took it took them a while. Basically, you're losers until you're not, and you're winners until you're not. Uh, I love this. This has been awesome. Uh, I'm. I, I guess we've already decided what the next one's going to be. Super Bowl three. Uh, very important for a very reason for a lot of reasons. Maybe we can get uh, get uh, Susie Kobler to help us out with that one. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. A little 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 slight veil nemesis or uh, nemesis. Uh, kind of uh, sideways. Yeah. Uh, well, good for oh, you. No, and I think these are great. I mean, I think, yeah, I think the history of the game is important. I, I, maybe it gets overplayed a little bit. I think baseball does a lot of this nostalgia and history of the game. They do a very good job with it. NFL, maybe not as great, but I think it's important because the game has changed a lot. We all know that. We've talked about it several times, right? It's a much different game today than it was in the 1960s. But it's games like this that build the like build the league mm-hmm. in the game it is today, elevated it as a TV medium, right? Um, right? Kind of games, and as much as we think about, we, I think we talked very early in, the, in in our discussion about the ice bowl having this sort of um, always whenever there's a cold game in the NFL, especially late in the season playoffs, they always refer to the ice bowl and the conditions. And that's fine. That, that's but there was a lot more to this game that we've touched upon about the great players, the great coaches, the juncture where we were in the history of the game just prior to the merger. You know, we have to keep in mind the NFL was also fighting a competitor in the AFL, so trying to build an audience, the greatness of the games, have a game that was televised, 
apparently one of the interesting things about the last play I was reading about was, you know, they had cameras set up there that actually captured, and there's a lot of great photographs of that key block. And so it was not lost to history. I mean, it was captured as it happened uh, to a television audience. And of course, you know, in, in the radio telecast and then in the coming days, newspaper accounts and photographs of this day and many of the books and local media still talk about this game. Uh, recently, I saw maybe just the last week or so when well, the local newspaper in the Green Bay area had uh, found thousands, they were working on digitizing thousands of old Green Bay Packer game photographs. And they actually found about a dozen or so from the ice bowl that had never been shown before, um, which is kind of cool. So that, that kind of history is still captured. And, um, you know, it's important because it's, it like, wouldn't be the, oh, we have a third person off today. A third. Oh, yes. he, yeah, that, he agrees. It was a great game. It is, yes. And that, a great part of, Amer of uh, NFL and American history, Laura, that's for sure. Whenever he interrupts, that's uh, Jasper the Friendly Corgi. You can follow him on Jasper underscore the Friendly Corgi. Also, Jasper's sister is here, Winnie, who did not hey. know to say. <laughs> uh, and you can also the same Instagram, Winnie the Jet. Right, Winnie? Cool. Yes. <laughs> Winnie's well, camera shy. <laughs> yes, Winnie's been a good girl this whole time, and so was Jasper up until that very end. Uh, that's the problem living in an apartment here on Mount Manitoba. Sometimes the uh, neighbors come home and he's protecting me. Yeah, I know. I got two dogs. Same thing. They're yeah. barking. Threat or no threat. They just bark at it. <laughs> I don't want to look back at that because I, I, I think it went like this. <laughs> after i was just talking about how oh, kids today aren't tough and then i just did that face but anyway uh say la vie uh with that it's uh time to bring this to a close this was great paul thank you so much you were the perfect person to do this with i cannot wait till we do this again i'm going to plug my other stuff if you like uh other things in the Bucknerverse, uh paul and i were part of a group where we do our mock committees uh for the pro football hall of fame and uh we're going to be doing that again i oh uh the 17th of january Okay. All right. So that we'll we'll be doing that uh, once we know who their official finalists are, so we can compare them to ours, and go from there. And everyone's going to be assigned somebody. So think about who you want to present. Uh, also, too, if you like bad songs and went number one, I've got a great <laughs> show called uh, "How the Hell Did This Go Number One." The next yeah. uh, the next song we're going to do uh, once my partner's back from our, her cruise is uh, the Osmonds. One bad. <laughs> oh, you probably could have picked a few songs, but I bet you got a good one. I, I think that's their only one that went number one. So oh, okay, yeah. So I had to go with that. Uh, Chris Borne and I, we do another show called uh, "This Crap Was on National Television." We just looked at a wrestling show called "Learning the Ropes." I remember that actually. I remember probably because because uh, you being a football fan because it was starred Lyle Alzado. That's right. Yes. That's right. Who That's did not? Okay. Yes. Who did not follow the footsteps of Alex Butkus <laughs> and Bubba Smith? Uh, Didn't yeah. translate too well into a TV career, did he? <laughs> well, no. He had the range of a football. I mean, like, yeah. it, was, it wasn't very good, but it was very interesting for what it was. Uh, Vinny Laspinuso also shows up on, on from time to time where he'll make the Hall of Fame case for random people. Sometimes I don't know who the hell he's talking about, but the next one he's going to do is Kurt Flood. So we're, we're going to shoot oh, yep. that on Monday. Oh, so, that's a good one. I'm super excited about that one. Sure. But I, 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 Vinny, I know you're watching. I love you, buddy. But I think you could actually make a Hall of Fame case for a circle. <laughs> he would try. He would try. He would, and he would probably come up with something slightly convincing, and then I'd be wondering after why I drink so much. Then I love it. You know that. Uh, with yeah. that, all right. Well, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's a lot pleasure. of fun to, to reminisce. So we talked about filming this outside, which maybe a week or so would have been appropriate, but it's a lot warmer. But we thought, well, maybe that's not so good. But we got it done. We got um, it done. Yeah. This is one of the photographs I just picked up off local okay. media. Um, there was an amateur. A uh, guy, fall, small, for whatever reason, that day was flying a small plane above Green Bay. I didn't even get it started. Got an aerial shot here of Lombardi Field before the game started with everybody in the stands freezing <laughs> as they were. But that was just the kind of day it was there in, uh, in Green Bay. He's, Thanks. Lucky. He's, he's lucky he got that off the ground. 
Yeah, there's some. He has some. He was just shooting some random kind of landscape shots. But he's got two or three of, of the stadium. Obviously, I don't know what point during the game, but uh, mm-hmm. at that temperature, why would you be up in a small plane? I have no idea. But but some great shots I've never seen before. It just came out recently. So. I ask my wife sometimes why she wants to go skydiving all the time. Why would you want to do that? But anyway, people have different things that they like. With that, all right, or wherever you may be, stay safe, everybody. All right, happy new year. Happy new year.